so much for the consistency of your word. Thank you for the love that you offer us, for the love that you've already provided us through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sanctifying us as a result of that, um, by believing on him as our savior and sending your Holy Spirit to come and live inside of us and then starting us on that lifelong journey of sanctifying us and causing us to become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, because of the work that you do inside of us. Um, Father, calls us to be uh, contemplating you, to be thinking about you um, each and every day throughout the day and to be doing as David did, to be praying um, all throughout the day without ceasing. Um, just to be spending that time communing with you and talking with you. And in so doing, Father, I mean, and in so doing, uh, Father, work in our minds to renew our minds and, and uh, again, be causing us to become more like your son, Jesus Christ. This morning, open up our hearts and our minds, mine included, to uh, hear and to learn accurately what it is that your word has to share with us. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's right before 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We'll read for you this morning verses 1 through 11 in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. I'm reading from uh, King James. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief, a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another even as ye also do. Last week we spent our study on verse 4. Verse, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. We spent our time in that verse and we saw Paul desiring to keep the Thessalonians' attention by injecting another use of but. Right? That use of but. In verse 1, he used the phrase but of to introduce two different events, right? Two different events, the event of the rapture, which had taken place, which Paul was talking about at the end of chapter 4, and now the event of the day of the Lord. So in verse 1, he was, he was using that phrase, but of, to talk about two different events. Here in verse 4, we learn that Paul was using the phrase, but you, to introduce the difference between two groups of people. So in verse 1, it was but of, to introduce the idea of these two different events, and in verse 4, He's using but you to introduce the difference between two groups of people. Now he again, in doing this, he reminded the Thessalonians of their intimate unity with himself, with God the Father, with Christ, with one another, all by using that term brethren, right? By using that term brethren, which we've seen Paul use a number of times. That term which defined the Thessalonians the group, the body there, which defined them practically as coming from the exact same womb, as though they actually had the same father and same mother, that term which so united them. In so doing, Paul was reminding the Thessalonians that whatever the difference was, okay, whatever the dividing line that was, that did exist between the two groups that he was introducing to them, whatever the dividing line that existed there, it was not something that would separate the Thessalonians from one another, because they were all part of the same group. They were brethren, just like you and I are, all part of that same group, the greater church, the church of Christ, all right, because of the sacrifice that he made for us, all being brethren, all so close as though we were actually 
born of the same mother and father. So finally, we identify the two groups that Paul was referring to. Darkness, in verse 4, that was one group, and the other group was light, in verse 5. We saw how this dividing line between darkness and light, we saw how this dividing line was not something that was new, but it was evidenced even at the very beginning of creation itself. Because in the very first command that we have recorded that God spoke on the earth after it was created, he spoke, let there be light. And in so doing, he divided the darkness from the light. As such, you and I considered how God's agenda then for the created world was to rescue it from darkness. And we looked at how God's agenda for created man was that man, that we too, be rescued from darkness. Again, verse 4 and verse 5. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. I want to take a caveat here and remind us again that this dividing line that Paul's talking about between the light and the darkness, again, this has nothing to do with any of our works, good or bad. Right? Because we are of the light, that doesn't mean that we are better somehow than others who are of the darkness. That's not true. The reality is every created being on the face of this or everyone, we are all born with a sinful nature, all in the same playing field, every single one of us. And the only reason there's a dividing line is because of Jesus Christ. And so those of us who are of the day, those of us who are children of the day or children of the light, are only children of the light and children of the day because of what Christ has done. There's an identification truth here that I don't want you to miss, and I'm going to read verse 5 again. Ye are all the children of the light. I'm going to read both verses. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. We've talked about, we've talked before about how the scripture, how God's word, the Bible, is full of all different kinds of very practical and clear truths, teachings, right? Everything that's in God's word is true, right? It's profitable to us. But we've also talked about how there are more subtle things, too, that we can learn from Scripture. For example, why things are written in a certain way, or the style, why Paul chose to write things with a certain style, right? Because there's Nothing. God was very intentional in inspiring his word. And Paul was very intentional in writing it. As we read, we not only understand that the, t- the church, the entire church, both we who are living now and those who have gone before, we are identified as brethren, all of us. The Thessalonians, the Ephesians, the Romans, all of us. Those of us who live now, those of us who have gone before, all of us who believe on Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're all part of that brethren, all part of that church the group here that Paul identifies as the children of light. But in addition to the fact, in addition to the fact of who we are, in addition to the truth, the reality that we are children of light, I want you to consider for a moment the order in which Paul was writing, the order in which Paul was explaining this new truth, this truth to the Thessalonians. Paul didn't merely... He didn't merely tell the Thessalonians, hey, you guys are children of the light. He didn't merely just tell them who they were. In fact, he didn't even start off this section by telling them who they were. Rather, he sandwiched, he sandwiched the truth of who they were in between the truth of who they were not. That's what he started off with. And again, the truth of who they were not. That's what he ended with in those verses. Now, he could have just saved some time. He could have condensed the verses a little bit. He could have just said, but ye, brethren, are the children of the light and the children of the day, and left it at that. But that's not exactly what he said. Instead, he began the section by identifying for them who they were not. And he ended the same section again by telling them who they were not. 
He said, you are not in darkness. You are children of the light. You are children of the day. We are not of the night. We are not of the darkness. That's the order. So why did he do this? What was his reason? We know that he was very well educated. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had grown up and studied with the best of Greek and Roman influences. He was very intentional, and Paul was very methodical in what he wrote. He chose his words very carefully. And, of course, they were inspired by God. So we know that there was a reason for not just what he wrote, but how he wrote it. We know that there was a reason for him to be writing them in this order. So why did he take the time to indicate so intentionally who they were not? Why not just tell them who they were and move on? Well, we have a couple other examples like this in Scripture. A couple other examples of people who were told who they were not before they were told who they were. A couple other examples. Genesis chapter 17. Let's turn there. Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, we'll read verses 1 through 6. In this passage, Genesis 17, verses 1 through 6, God does the same kind of thing with Abram when changing his name. He doesn't merely tell him who he is. He first tells him who he is not. Let's read these verses. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him. God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram. There we have it. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram. You are not Abram. That's what he says. You are no more Abram. God didn't just look at him and say, you're going to be a father of many nations, and now you're going to be called Abraham. No, he identified who he was not going to be any longer. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. Find something similar a few chapters later in Genesis, Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 through 28. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 through 28. This is where the angel of the Lord, we learn later this was the angel of the Lord, wrestled with Jacob and, and did kind of the same thing here. In verse 24, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. That man that he wrestled with, we find out, was the angel of the Lord. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, when, he saw, when the angel of the Lord saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, the angel of the Lord touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. He kept going. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And here we have it. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Same thing here. The angel of the Lord didn't say, What's your name? Jacob says, It's Jacob. The angel of the Lord didn't respond, No, it's Israel. He didn't just say, No, your name is now Israel. He first identified who he was not going to be anymore. He said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob. No more. No more are you going to be known as Jacob. Now you're going to be known as Israel. 
For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So why are they doing it in this way? It's not this way everywhere in the scripture that someone's name is changed, or when someone is given a name. It's not this way everywhere. Why is it done this way here? Why not just tell them who they are and be done with it and move on? Well, a few years ago, my mother wrote a poem. Right? You may know, some of you may have read her, some of her poems before. You could call her a poet. She's written many of them. This one was written in the 1970s, I believe, and it was a poem that was written about my dad. Okay. See, as some of you can relate, as I can relate, my dad struggled with a number of years with not understanding who his identity was in Jesus Christ. He was a believer. He had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior when he was pretty young. And he knew undoubtedly that he was going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ did for him. But he didn't understand exactly what that meant as far as Christ living his life through him. What did that mean for his, in his identity? What did that mean? Who was he? And so he wrestled for a number of years in areas that were associated with not understanding who he was as this new nature in Jesus Christ. Okay? Fortunately, the Lord is very gracious and, uh, and revealed that to my father, you know, through his word, through his word. You know, what it means when the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ comes into our life and the Holy Spirit is living inside of us and sanctifies us. And he learned that later on, but for a period of time, he wrestled with that and didn't understand. My mom wrote a poem about that time period for him, and it's called My Name. And as I read this poem to you, I want you to... I want you to just kind of make a mental note of all the times that you hear the words darkness, light, name, and I want you to think about the idea of identity okay, as we're reading this, as I'm reading this. My name. When I look down the wrong road, when I look down the long road, darkness do I see. Darkness all around and deep inside of me. No other path to follow, only one, no more. Will this be the same like the one I walked before? Shadowed figures in the night, my stopped up ears, my blinded sight, I will not move, I'll stand here still. But here it comes, that awful chill. I'm cold, I'm old. I see no light. I know no wrong. I desire no right. I feel no anger. I feel no pain. I want no answer. I know not my name. I know not my name. I work. I play. I eat and sleep. I talk the word. I live deceit. Again, I turned and ran back to the place where I had been, made my choice, this is the way, and now I'm caught again. This spot is so familiar, just like it was before. I'll settle in. It feels like me. This is my place. Worth nothing more. Repeat my actions. Play my game. Does not matter. I know not my name. I know not my name. Is this torment or is this fun? How many am I? Or am I one? I've chosen. I'm stuck. I can't hear, can't see. All that I wanted has destroyed me. Yet, still, I'm alive. No blinded and deaf, still there is truth. Hope is not dead yet. Lord God, merciful one, you've shown me the way. Still I must choose. Thank you for today. Give me the courage to give up my game. Help me to search for and at last find my name. If Paul were speaking to my dad, in fact, I was thinking to my, because my, my dad died about a month ago now, a little over a month ago. And I was, as I was writing this, I thought, wait a minute, my dad might be talking to Paul, you know, right now. Who knows? You know, that's pretty amazing. Um, 
But if, if Paul were speaking to my dad in response to that thinking at that time, he would have responded to the first phrase in this poem, when I look down the long road, darkness do I see, darkness all around and deep inside of me. He would have responded with the same truth that he repeatedly offered the Thessalonians by saying, but you are not in darkness. You are a child of the light, of the day. You are not of the night. You are not of the darkness. Sometimes, sometimes, it's not enough for you and I to hear who it is that we are until we first come to terms with the reality of God's word and his truths in telling us who we are not. Sometimes it can be difficult for you and I to fully accept who we are in Jesus Christ until we first recognize the truths in God's word which tell us who we are not. All of us, all of us have dark places. We all have sin. We all have sin in our history, places in the present, things in our life that demonstrate to one degree or another an area of darkness. If not, then we would be in heaven right now, completely sanctified and glorified with bodies that never sinned. Even as believers in Jesus Christ, you and I can sometimes start to wonder if maybe darkness is what really defines us. We need to be reminded and we need to hold fast in knowing that the darkness of sin, once having defined us, right, with that sinful nature, the darkness of sin, once having defined us and once ruling over us in that sinful nature into which we were born, the darkness of sin no longer defines us. It no longer has to rule over us, right? Because we are new creatures in Christ. Christ was raised from the dead. Christ died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And so you and I who believe on him as our Savior, our sinful natures were put to death just like he died. And we were raised to life with new, cre with new natures living inside of us just like Christ was risen from the dead. We no longer have to be mastered by sin and we are no longer defined as darkness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. I'm going to read the list again. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Now look. Look at what Paul's about to say next. Look at what he doesn't say. Paul does not continue in this passage by saying, but you, are no you no longer fall into any of these temptations anymore. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say to the Corinthians, he doesn't say, but you no longer sin in any of these areas. He doesn't say that either. Neither does he say, but you, you Corinthians, wow, you guys no longer, you now live perfectly sinless lives and have completely set aside all of your sins. He doesn't say that. This is what he says. But you are washed. You are sanctified. 
For you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Friends, these things, the things in our old nature, they are what defined us and ruled over us in our old nature. The, what, the sins that we committed once defined who we were. They were the very definition of who we were when we were, because we were born into a sinful nature, and that is what defined us. No longer. Your name is no longer sin nature. Your name is now new nature. No longer sin nature. Your name is no longer darkness. Your name is now light. It's no longer darkness. And we are all children of the light. One group of that children of the light, of the brethren that Paul's talking about here. For the Thessalonians, having lived years in the world following sensual pursuits of their own, the high life, the high society, women of influence who were there, obsessed still with the spiritual afterlife that was a big deal to the culture of the day, right? they likely struggled at times, like you and I can, with who they were, with their identity. Really knowing, really knowing who they were in Christ. Really understanding what it means that their old nature was indeed put to death. And that they now were no longer of the darkness. So Paul kept reminding them. He kept reminding them that they were brethren. And here he reiterates that they are not of darkness. And in this repetition, they were reminded of what had already died in their life. And what no longer defined them. The sin nature, it's darkness. And they were again able to be affirmed that who they were now were a new creation, a new nature, children of the light. Verses 4 through 6 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. You see, there was a command now. There was a command. There was a command now that the Thessalonians were able to carry out because of Christ's identity, because of them being the light, because of Christ's identity of light now living inside of them. There was a command that because of Christ, they were able to be carrying out. The call... Paul was giving them, the charge was to not sleep as others do. Sleeping in some kind of a spiritual slumber and oblivion without concern or understanding as to the days to come. Living in willful ignorance and false bliss, being entirely unconcerned about sin. He was telling them, don't sleep like this. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. Instead, let us watch. Let us watch. Be aroused from your sleep. Be awake. Be watchful. Be on the alert. Be vigilant. Be mentally aware so that your mind is not taken and carried away by the flesh's desire to sleep. This command, in the Greek, this command is what's called uh, a present tense in the Greek, which means it's not just present for now, but it's an ongoing present tense. It called for an ongoing, continual state of alertness. That they would be constantly aware. Because remember, what we're talking about here, the two events that were introduced at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, the two events are the rapture, which will take place whereby Christ comes and rescues the entire body of the church out from the earth, right? The rapture and the day of the Lord. We learn how the day of the Lord, how that expression, whenever we see it, is always talking about the forthcoming judgment on those who have chosen to reject Jesus Christ and the amazing sacrifice that he did for them. That would happen to them because of surprise, coming to them like a stealth bomber, all right, without any kind of warning, because they're not awake, because they're asleep. 
So Paul's command here to the Thessalonians is that they would be constantly aware of Christ's coming for them in the rapture, that they were to be watching, eagerly waiting, and anticipating Christ's return, watchful and vigilant as though it could happen at any moment, right? The reality was, the reality was that because they were believers, okay, because they were believers, they would not be overtaken in the day of the Lord. They would be rescued before that. So Paul's call for them was to act like it. Paul's call for them was to act like it and be eagerly awaiting this rapture, eagerly watchful and anticipating it. Paul's call for the Thessalonians, it's the same for you and me today. It's the same. Many distractions in the world, right? Many distractions in the world, and they call for us to sleep. They call for us to live in a way with disconcern and oblivion to sin. They call for us to live in a way without regard, without care to the coming time of Christ rescuing us. Listen, the, the more that you and I engage in sin, the more calloused we become to it. The more calloused we become to sin, the less consideration we will have for the coming of Christ in his rapture. The more calloused we are to sin, the more calloused we are to the painful effects of sin around us, the more we were to join the world in any kind of sin, right? the more that we do, the more we engage our minds in sin, the less, <laughs> the less understanding we have of our need to be raptured from this earth. Suddenly we're believers, but living as though we're kind of mixed in with becoming caught up with sinful ways in the world and forgetting that we really need to be rescued from sin. Paul's call for them was not to sleep in this way, but to be ever vigilant, expectantly watchful, eagerly anticipating Christ's return for us, not the return judgment that will come during the day of the Lord, but to be eagerly anticipating Christ's return, the rapture, to rescue us before the day of the Lord begins. As I shared a couple weeks ago, throughout this entire year, each Sunday morning that I preach to you, I'm going to be uh, sharing the word, and then at the end of the share, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about who Jesus Christ is in that passage. Right? Because it's, it's through the Holy Spirit it's through, it's because of the life of Jesus Christ that we are able to be sanctified and that we are able to have lives that are not only everlasting in time, but have an everlasting and abundantly fulfilling life. Not, necessar not, not with material possessions. In, in reality, really, how fulfilling are they anyway, right? I mean, some have material possessions, some not, but that's not the point that he's making there. When he's talking about fulfilling life, it's this abundant, fulfilling life that we can have as believers by being more intimately acquainted with Jesus Christ. So he came to give us everlasting life, but he came to give it more abundantly. So I'm going to share with you who Jesus Christ is, just one aspect of who Jesus Christ is in this passage. And then we're going to talk about what, how, who Jesus Christ is, how that's applicable to our lives. I'm doing that now for a couple of weeks, and we're going to continue, continue on with that for the rest of the year. This week, as we now consider who Jesus Christ is in this passage, I want you to know him as the longed-for one. The longed-for one. The longed-for one. As the longed-for one. Christ is positioned to meet all of our needs and to free us. He's positioned to meet all of our needs and to free us from all cares and all concerns. He is the one powerful to destroy the nature of sin, to provide you with this new nature that we have inside of us, and to not only give everlasting life, but to give this everlasting life with abundance. He's the longed for one. practically for you and me. Understanding Jesus as this longed-for one, 
gives all the reason in the world for us to not only willingly, but cheerfully and eagerly do what it is that Paul's charging us to do. To eagerly and longingly be looking for his return with great anticipation. He's the longed for one. We long for him. For when he comes, when he comes, all of what our heart longs for, all that we have begun to understand now in a little way, right? Because he is living inside of us, the Holy Spirit. All of what we have become to understand in a little, all of what our heart truly longs for will be understood completely, entirely, infinitely, as we are one in physical presence with this longed for one, with Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray. Father God, your Son is our longed for one. Um, it is such an amazing thing, Father, to even try to grasp the reality of what it was like of what it means for a perfect and holy God, um, for his son to come down here, to be one on the same level with us as a mere human, and yet God at the same time, to live his life as a, as a man, and then to be sacrificed on a cross for us, making every decision throughout his entire life based upon you and your will for his life, and never having a sinful thought or even emotion go through his body, responding to everyone out of love, even when taking the form of anger. Father, thank you for this gift of salvation. Thank you for this gift, and thank you for the reality that the salvation does not just stop with our eternal life, but that you provide for us the opportunity to have this so richly fulfilling and abundant life because Jesus Christ meets our deepest needs. Father, regardless of what kinds of physical needs we have, regardless of what kinds of things are going on around us, or circumstances, or how people are acting or treating us, Father, the reality is that your son, Jesus Christ, meets our deepest inner needs, the needs that we really have. And we long for that day, God, when he comes to rescue us in the air, when the trumpet blows, and we are taken up to meet him in the air, along with those who have gone before us as believers, and where we one day will spend a physical eternity with, with you and with Christ, face to face, forever. Thank you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.